Snap quiz, everyone. How does the signal that you're viewing right now get to whatever device you're watching it on? Most of us, I suspect, can't explain it, or for that matter, many other things we encounter every single day, from appliances to complex ideas. Stephen Sloman has an explanation for our inability to explain such things, and he outlines that in a new book that he's co-authored called The Knowledge Illusion, Why We Never Think Alone. He is also a professor of cognitive, linguistic, and psychological sciences at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, and editor-in-chief of the journal Cognition. And Stephen Sloman joins us now to do some thinking together. It's nice to have you in the studio. That's a great pleasure. Well, we should explain that you may be at Brown in the last 25 years, but you're from these parts, actually, originally. I sure am. I'm home right now. You grew up, what, like two minutes from the studio, right? That's right. Okay, so welcome home. Let's uh, start with this. You start your book with the story of the detonation of a nuclear bomb called the Shrimp in 1954, and you write that this story illustrates a fundamental paradox of humankind. The human mind is both genius and pathetic, brilliant and idiotic. Okay, how so? Well, as individuals, we just don't know very much. And more than anything, we think we know a lot more than we do. Um, and yet, as a, as a species, as a society, we accomplish amazing things. You know, and we thought the nuclear bomb was just a great example of both what we can do, build incredible scientific devices, um, but it also represents some of the limitations of humanity. That is, we sometimes use those bombs. So we have the capability of doing incredibly scientific, far-reaching, adventurous things, but is the second part of that equation a reference to the lack of wisdom that we may bring to bear? Well, we might call it wisdom. In particular, it's a reference to the lack of knowledge, right? And so there are all kinds of examples of lack of knowledge. You know that 25% of Americans don't know whether the Earth revolves around the sun or the sun revolves around the Earth. You know, 50% of Americans don't know whether antibiotics kill bacteria or viruses or both. There's just a basic lack of knowledge, something that TV talk show hosts make fun of all the time. Often people can't name the vice, people on the street can't name the vice president. Um, and, but more than anything, the, the point of the book is not that people are stupid. The point is that people aren't aware how little they understand. And this has been demonstrated in the laboratory. So initially, it was demonstrated by a great psychologist at, at Yale named Frank Kyle and his students, who um, would ask people how well they understood simple, common objects, like ballpoint pens and toilets. And, uh, and people felt they had a sense of understanding. And, and then he would say, OK, how do they work? Explain them. And what he discovered is that people essentially had nothing to say. They just didn't understand how they worked. So then when he then asked them again how well did they understand, uh, their ratings went lower. It's like people acknowledged that their illusion of, of knowledge or their illusion of explanatory depth, as Kyle likes to say, um, was punctured. Uh, does this matter? In other words, is it consequential that we actually can't explain how the ballpoint pen works? Well, I don't think it's consequential for ballpoint pens, and I don't think it's consequential for toilets. Um, but it's consequential when we're talking uh, about political policies, for instance. Right? Um, what's scary is when people think they understand how political policies or politicians themselves will operate. And it turns out that they really don't understand. Um, so. The idea we have is that the reason we have this illusion of understanding is because we confuse what other people know for what we know, right? Other people understand how toilets work, and we sort of inherit that knowledge. Understanding is contagious. Um, can I tell you briefly about a little experiment that Please. we did to demonstrate this? So we told, we made up some simple scientific phenomena, like, for instance, um, glowing rocks. We said, Scientists have discovered these glowing rocks. And in one case, we said, the scientists uh, haven't explained how they work. They don't yet understand them. How well do you understand them? And not surprisingly, people said they didn't understand them at all. Another group of people, we said, uh, scientists have discovered these glow glowing rocks. They understand them. They have a complete explanation. How well do you understand them? So we gave them no information about the glowing rocks. We just said the scientists understand them. And now people, people's sense of understanding increased just a little bit. 
So they have the sense of understanding by virtue of other people's understanding. And we've shown this with political policies now. Um, so when everybody's sense of understanding depends on the sense of understanding of people around them, and there's no real fundamental basis for that understanding, that can be kind of scary when big decisions are made. So our fundamental claim is that the mind is a communal entity, that we should stop thinking about the mind as something that exists merely inside the skull, but rather it's something that we share as a group, as a community. We've heard those stories before where, for example, the, the fear instinct uh, is evolutionary, right, from our time on the Serengeti and so on and so forth. You, you needed to have that boost of adrenaline to avoid being eaten by a lion. Right. Is there something about some people being unwilling to acknowledge that they don't know things that has yeah. come about as a result of evolution? Um, I think that the right way to think about that is um, that there's no disadvantage to it. Right? So since we live as a community and our, our mind is a communal entity, um, uh, and the reason for this is that there's a division of cognitive labor, right? So we each have our little bit of expertise, and we all contribute to the community to work together as a whole. So the way I think about it is that there's no real reason to know what you know relative to the guy beside you, because all that knowledge is accessible to you. So what the way the mind works is to store the ability to access information as opposed to the information itself. So why do we live in the illusion? Well, um, perhaps it's because you know a little, it feels good. Um, Voltaire said uh, an illusion is the first of all pleasures. But it also perhaps provides a little motivation. If we really understood how well uh, we understand things, we wouldn't do things like build our own bicycles and renovate our own houses. Uh, but we do, because we can access the information. Well, we've been, so, well, I shouldn't say we. I've been sort of pussyfooting around the whole Trump issue right here, so let's go hit that right on the head right now, shall we? Uh, the pe many of the people, or some of the people, you tell me how many, who supported Donald Trump did so with this knowledge illusion, presumably. You prepared to go there? Yes, I, I think that's true, but I will add that, you know, I think the other side suffers from the illusion, too. Right? The, this is not a liberal thing. This is not a conservative thing. This is not an American thing or a Canadian thing. This is a human thing. So everybody suffers from the knowledge Does illusion. one side I, suffer from it more than the other? Look, I think the individual Donald Trump suffers from it big time. Right? He seems to feel he understands things that he has absolutely, or he shows absolutely no evidence that he knows anything about. That's true. Whether his supporters suffer from the illusion you know, I would want to be a little careful about. Understood. Okay. Let's do, uh, let's have you tell us about this political experiment that you ran, essentially offering options on opinions like, should there be a national flat tax? Should there be a single-payer health care system? Should we impose unilateral sanctions on Iran? Cap and trade as it relates to the environment, merit-based pay for teachers? Anyway, there was a long list of yeah. political options that you gave to people. That's right. You ran this experiment. What did That's you find? Right. So the experiment was actually, it, it had exactly the same form as the experiment I described to you earlier in which Frank Kyle and his students used ballpoint pens and toilets. We, we asked people how well they understood each of these policies, whether or not there should be a national flat tax, for instance, and then we asked them to explain the policy. Uh, and, and then we asked them again, how well do you understand the policy? And just as Kyle found, we, we were able to puncture their sense of understanding. We punctured their illusion of knowledge so that they rated their understanding of the policy lower afterwards. In addition, uh, we asked them to express their degree of confidence that it was a good or bad policy. And it turns out by puncturing their illusion of understanding, we also punctured their degree of confidence. So they became less confident, less extreme, and as a group, they were less polarized. More open-minded? Interestingly, we did run experiments where after doing this, we, we asked them whether they would like to now see more information about the policy and learn more about it. And in fact, a student of mine named Julia Shub did this in a high school with um, some high school learning materials. 
we did not find that people became more open-minded so to our surprise and chagrin. It was disappointing. But you know, our, our interpretation is that when you show someone that they're dumb, they basically don't want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> shock, shock. Yeah. This is, I mean, you're, you're, what, what's popping into my head right now are these polls that we see all the time. And we just, in the province of Ontario here, brought in a cap and trade program. The government of Ontario brought it in. And it's brand new. And I've seen so many polls asking the public, now what do you think of the cap and trade policy that the Ontario government is considering implementing? And you, you know, you'll get whatever the numbers show without stopping to ask the question, does anybody actually know what a cap and trade policy is? And I'm convinced 98% of the public don't know what it is because I study this stuff and I barely know what it is. So how, how do we actually get the message out to people that these polls are not worth the, you know, they're not worth the paper they're printed on, frankly, and we shouldn't be using them to influence public policy. Well, yeah, so, so that's an interesting and deep question, whether the polls are worth the paper they're printed on. You know, it, it's sort of, it's related to the question whether democracy is a good thing, right? Um, so should you allow people to express their opinion? And I, and I think the answer is clearly yes. I, your point is well taken. Uh, the justification for polls and the justification for democracy does not come from an understanding about how the mind works. People don't understand, but I still think you have to give them the right to vote. No, fair enough, uh, uh, obviously. But, but taking a public opinion survey on whether you want your taxes yeah. lowered right. or whether you want more funding for your local right. hospital is a lot different from right. what do you think of the cap and that's trade fair. policy. That, no, that's fair. So I, I just uh, sometimes get a little frustrated yeah. with how policy is made on the basis of these kinds of flimsy polls. Yeah. You no. share my concern yes. about this? No, you absolutely. Okay. And in fact, one thing we discuss in the book is all the referenda that take place across the, across the United States. California is famous for it. And, and I just think that that's a terrible way to make policy. Mm -hmm. We really should be relying on the expertise in our community, not on how individuals think about things. Expertise yeah. is out these days, my friend. In some communities, not in all communities. Where, where, okay, that's interesting. Where, what community prizes expertise in decision making? Um, so the data show, for instance, that Democrats have much more faith in science than Republicans do. Um, you know, I, I, I think the knowledge classes uh, have prized expertise um, for forever and, and continue to. Right? So those groups of people who actually are experts prize expertise. Yeah. Where, where you see people losing faith in expertise is in communities that um, have not supplied the expertise and as a result have not had any of the levers of power in their hmm. hands. Let's go on to, I want to read two quotes to you. Uh, these are, you'll, you'll indulge us here because these are actually not from your book. Okay. This is, uh, the first one here is from Jonathan Gottschall's book, The Storytelling Animal, How Stories Make Us Human. And he writes, the storytelling mind is allergic to uncertainty, randomness, and coincidence. It is addicted to meaning. If the storytelling mind cannot find meaningful patterns in the world, it will try to impose them. In short, the storytelling mind is a factory that churns out true stories when it can, but will manufacture lies when it can't. And let's follow that one up with Jonathan Haidt's book, The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. And he says, people bind themselves into political teams that share moral narratives. Once they accept a particular narrative, they become blind to alternative moral worlds. Taking those two quotes into account and your own research, do you think there's a simpatico in all of that? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the thing to notice about the first quote is that the stories we tell ourselves are really social entities, right? A, a story is almost by definition something that we share. So it's not just a description of what's going on inside the skull, but it's rather a description of how it is that we go about sharing knowledge and sharing information as a community. And that's our fundamental claim. And as far as Haidt's quote is concerned, you know, the, there, there are two kinds of issues in the world. There are issues in which there's uh, there's common acceptance about what ground truth is, right? So when it comes to toilets and ballpoint pens, um, we all accept that plumbers are no more than we do and, and, and can give us the information that, that we need. Then there are other issues like whether there should be a cap and trade policy or whether or not ab abortion should be legal in which there really is no 
common accepted fount of wisdom. And what happens is that we divide into communities based on our values, and we, we take positions that are consistent with the values that are, compo that are composed by the stories that we tell mm. one another. In which case, let's finish up on this. Now that we know this, yeah. because your research has pointed us to it, what do we do about it? So uh, I, I, I don't, that, that's the critical question, and, and I wish that I could solve all the world's problems. I, I can't, and, and, and the book doesn't either. I, I have to I'm very admit. disappointed, Steve. I'm sorry. I'm very disappointed. Um, but I think there are a couple of things to say. One is uh, we should try to get outside our echo chambers. We should appreciate that we rely on our communities and that rather than being rational processors, processors of information, what we often are, are channelers of beliefs that are held by our community. And uh, if we accept that, we might have a little less hubris, we might be a little le less extreme, we might consider the possibility that people on the other side um, have something to say, and we may be able to, again, have conversations. We may be able to, again, have Christmas dinner with our families. Um, the other thing to say is that this, the process of explanation is a very specific thing, and it's not something that, we, that most people engage in most of the time, right? So most of our conversations are about generating, most of our political conversations are about generating reasons. Why is it that we value some, why do we believe in a policy, some particular policy? We often retreat to discussing our basic values, right, and how this policy represents our values. We're talking about ourselves and our own relation to the policy. That's what a lot of dinner time pub conversation is about. If instead the conversation were about how does this policy work? What are the actual consequences of this policy going to be? Right, a kind of cost benefit analysis. We'd get outside ourselves and we'd have something more objective to talk about. And I think that would offer a common ground to have a conversation. Since you finished up in the pub, I will just conclude by saying wonderful food for thought and drink, I guess, as well. Stephen Sloman, author of The Knowledge Illusion. He also comes to us from Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. Great to meet you here on TVO. Thanks well, so thank much. Thank you so much. This was great. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.